um, in the background behind it. So he's the medical director of Ada County. He's really the one who has put in a lot of work on this protocol, did all of the research, writing of the protocol, and has spent probably more hours than he would like to count in meetings trying to get this where it is today. So uh, feel free to ask questions as you guys go along, and I'll be around for a little bit afterwards if anybody needs anything to me. Thanks. Appreciate you guys having me here. Um, so as Carrie said, my name's Ben. Uh, I work for Ada County. So this uh, this whole issue kind of started as an interesting project, just as a, a, a mere query of why are we doing certain things in EMS with sort of a quasi lack of evidence based practice, um, all based on anecdotal stuff from the past. And it's kind of blossomed into this after presented this at the trauma conference last year. And then talking with Bill Morgan, it was like, gosh, why aren't we actually doing this? And and talking with Dr. Peterson, the medical director, it just kind of blew up. So that's kind of where the inception of this whole thing came in. If you have any questions, by all means, stop me. Uh, hopefully, we should be doing about an hour or so, um, and we can ask any, answer any questions at the end of this. So uh, my disclaimer, uh, I have absolutely no financial bias in this talk. Uh, the information that I'm giving you is by no means the word of God. It's really just kind of a conglomeration of research that was took about a month or two to kind of put together uh, just a lot of searching in library time. So what I find may not be what everybody else finds. So there's always subject to interpretation on that. Anytime you do these either literary searches or you're actually trying to investigate a project, you have to always tread tread lightly and tread cautiously, and I think you kind of step back and use the common sense factor when you're doing a lot of this in terms of the application of some of the things that you're you're actually trying to implement. And so it's got to kind of do the gut check by the time you're ultimately said and done with this. If I happen to drop the F-bomb, I'm sorry. Uh, I am uh, I'm underslept, so if I stutter and mumble and do all kinds of weird things, uh, I'm not drunk yet, but uh, probably just a little bit sleep deprived. So we're here to have fun. Uh, I borrowed some pictures from the internet to try and keep it a little bit lively. Uh, so uh, by all means, like I say, I'm a pretty relaxed guy. So let me know if you guys have any thoughts or questions or and at the end of this, if there's anything I can do to make this a better presentation for you or somehow make it more interesting. So with all that being said, I'll give, tell you a little bit about myself. I, had my, I started in EMS because I was a poor uh, starving college student, so I started as a national ski patroller, ultimately ended up working with Far West Ski Patrol, their professional organization uh, up in North Lake Tahoe. Did that for the better part of eight, nine years. Great way to get some free skiing in. I worked EMS in Sacramento uh, for an independent ambulance company startup that is ironic because the thing has grown into this multi-million dollar organization. I was part of the first hire group. so. Had a ton of fun, but this was one of our station posts where we'd go out and we'd play golf at the golfing range. I uh, did my residency at University of Pittsburgh, which had a pretty heavy EMS focus. So we had a physician fly car that we'd work on. Uh, we were able to basically respond to all critical patients, vehicle entrapment. So that was always kind of fun. I ended up working with Stat Medevac for two years of residency and then a, another year and a half afterwards. <coughs> so I got to get some flight time, which was kind of fun. So. I, I've, I think we've kind of, along with Dr. Peterson's, you know, experiences, we've kind of, we, we kind of get what you're, what you're doing out there, what you have to deal with, which is, I think, a real benefit to you having Dr. Peterson here because she can actually offer you some real world perspective and not just try and preach from the, from the back of the room and not understand what you guys are actually dealing with on a day to day basis. Just to kind of prep you a little bit, you know, EMS has been around for years and years. Uh, Dominique Jean Larie was uh, Napoleon's uh, private physician. Napoleon was genius enough to be able to say, if I can actually patch my people up on the battlefield, I can put a gun in their hand and get them back out to fight again. And that's kind of where the whole inception of a, of a pre-hospital emergency system came from. It was very, very slow to develop, slow to catch on. It wasn't until you know the 1940s where you kind of started getting these mom and pop ambulances. You know, we hear about the hearses and all these other things. You know, they're either going to cart you to the hospital or cart you to the morgue. Um, but you, you look between then and where we're at now, and it's really kind of this quantum leap of what we have available to us. We've got you know super fast ambulances. We've got mobile intensive care units. But the one thing that's been lacking in this whole process 
is adequate EMS research. And so when we're trying to actually develop protocols and we're actually trying to put some practical, hands-on education into this, it's sometimes hard to find things that are applicable to the pre-hospital setting. You end up extrapolating a lot of this out of, out of just in-house medical research, which is oftentimes difficult to do. Not to mention there's usually not a lot of money involved for researchers involved in trying to get EMS research pushed. So spine boards kind of were a, <coughs> the, the, and the reason I mention all that history is the spine boards were just kind of a tag along to all of this. So from a trauma system standpoint, it was really kind of developed in the 1950s, a little bit more in the 1960s became a little bit more of an organized uh, entity in terms of saying, gee, maybe we should try and develop protocols based on what we know and what we've seen coming in the door. Part of that was an orthopedic surgeon who was consulted in this in 1967 who essentially said, well, these people who have potential back injuries, they need to be they need to be immobilized. We can't have them flopping around. You can't throw them over your shoulder and just chuck them in the back of an ambulance. You know, we need to come up with something. And, and that was where they basically said, well, let's just put them on a rigid spine board. And that's stuck. And, and it's that's where we're at today. And you know, up until now, it's really not been challenged. It hasn't been thought of. It's just, yeah, okay, that's what that's what we do. So that's where kind of the background of some of this stuff comes in. So you, you say, what's the the actual purpose of what it was developed for, and it was really, it's an extrication device. So it wasn't really developed as a immobilization device per se, but it's an extrication device to get somebody out of, a, uh, out of, a, out of harm's way so that they're not flopping around. You know, you look at some of the, the at least the med legal cases that come out of this, and the people that get sued are the ones that, you know, take a patient that's drunk, throw them over their shoulder, and sure enough, they're paralyzed. Well, that's a lot of manipulation, and I think if we can, based on the resources that we have today, we can come up with a little better plan on how to do that. So what do we see the uh, spine boards used for? Basically, we see it now for anybody who has a traumatic mechanism. It, this, you know, these, uh, anybody watch the, the Bachelor or the Bachelorette? I know you're not going to admit it. My wife gets me to watch it. Um, <laughs> but I, I had to chuckle. It was, uh, I think it was like last season or the season before where this girl Fakes, kind of fakes falling down these stairs. She's up, she's wandering around the house, back and forth. Cameras are following her, and then ultimately the, the ambulance arrives. And so she's been walking around for the last 30 minutes, and they, they stop, you can't move. And they put a collar on her. And then they do this standing backboard thing, and then they're laying her down, and it's like, holy crap, she's been out there walking around, moving, going up and down the steps. You think what you're doing right now is actually gonna make a lick of difference as opposed to telling her to sit down on the cot, lay down and we can take you to the hospital. So anybody who has a traumatic mechanism all of a sudden gets labeled into this and pigeonholed into this thing where holy cow, you gotta get, I can say crap here, I think you can say crap, right? You say, holy crap, we need to backboard them, we need to immobilize them, they, they, they can't move. We also see it for trauma transfers, patients who've been cleared off of a board, all you're gonna do is move them from one cot to the next, drive down the road, take them and move them from one cot to the next. Why do they need to go on a long spine board? We see them as restraint devices, we see them for convenience, we see them for sadistic torture. <laughs> so there's a number of different reasons why people get backboard these days. So why are we doing this? And you know, a lot of it is, is just, it's been what we do. That's how we were trained. This is what we do. And there's this big fear that you know John Edwards and, and the legal system are going to come down on you for potentially doing something wrong. Somebody has a, a bad outcome. So what we're going to try and do is look and see if any of the literature supports any of this. So the reasons why we're not going to do this. So it takes a lot of manipulation to get a patient on the board. Trying to get somebody out of the front seat of a car, you're sliding the board underneath them, somebody's holding the C-spine, you're kind of tipping them up, turning them over, laying them down, sliding them up, doing all these things. It's a lot of manipulation. We're going to take a look at some of that as, as the hour progresses. For the most part, when somebody has a spine injury or spinal cord injury, the damage is done at the time of the incident. The chances of, of doing something subsequent to that are usually pretty low if you're careful. Uh, the things that we need to differentiate too are what's a spine injury or kind of a vertebral injury versus what's a spinal cord injury. And what we're really interested in in all of this is a spinal cord injury. Because you can always 
screw bones back together and do those things, but you can't take back necessarily the injury to the spinal cord itself. So in order to get actual damage to the spinal cord, you need either a partial or a complete transection of, of the cord itself or the neurons that are coming down out of the cord. And usually this happens at the time of the incident. It's not usually a secondary manifestation. There's this concept of stability in terms of, of, of fractures themselves, and I'm, I'm gonna to touch on it very briefly. So if you look at, a, at this called a sagittal section of the spinal cord, so you kind of cut it down the middle, you've got three ligaments that basically hold your spine together. You've got kind of an anterior portion, you've got a middle portion, you've got a posterior portion here. And all three of those basically are, are, are the truss that keeps the, the, the vertebrae from sliding around on each other. And you have some muscles that do help, but this is really kind of the hard, the hard framework for it. In order to get a unstable vertebral injury, you need at least two columns to be disrupted. So any two of these three need to be disrupted. That's when people usually get surgery. If you have one, you usually don't need to do it. Even the twos, a lot of times you don't necessarily have to do surgery on those. They can brace them, they can put them in external fixators, but the vast majority of the time, they don't necessarily need to be fixed. So just to give you an example, this, this is a, a CT scan and an MRI of uh, three column injury. So you've essentially completely disrupted this and you can see that the vertebral bodies have been shoved back into the spinal cord. So this person's basically paralyzed. There's all sorts of different flavors on how this is gonna go. Uh, you can have all different types of injuries, whether it's a rotational injury, whether it's a flexion extension injury, whether it's a lateral injury, you can have facet injuries. So these do come in multiple different areas. And again, usually at the time of the injury, you end up getting a little bit of bleeding into the cord, which is oftentimes that's that initial injury, which is not necessarily gonna change a ton with respect to moving a patient around. So that's the mechanical side of things. So there's other reasons why people will have progression of a neurologic deficit as the result of an injury. And these are the non-mechanical portions of this. And what we're talking about is uh, either damage to the cord itself, so the cord's been somehow compromised, which is usually a vascular injury. So you've disrupted the blood vessels that are given the, the spinal cord its blood flow, and so you've essentially starved it of oxygen, and the thing basically dies. You can also get uh, systemic hypotension. So again, this is a perfusion issue to the spinal cord. So for some reason or another, again, it's being starved of oxygen. You can get swelling, uh, you know, much the same way as I, I go slug Dave here in the arm, he gets swelling. That doesn't develop right away, it can develop over time. And so sometimes people come in, they look good, and, for, and then all of a sudden they're starting to get this progressive paralysis. And so it's oftentimes from the swelling of the cord. You can have electrolyte shifts, free radical formation, and essentially that's just, it, damage has been done, you have all of these infection fighting cells and cells that are trying to heal going in there, and in the, as the result of that, they release proteins and everything else that end up causing swelling which causes vascular compromise, which causes damage to the core, which causes paralysis. Last thing is cytokines, which is a very funny thing because in medicine, it, it was as you're going on rounds with the internal medicine attendings, they would always ask you a question of like, why is this happening and why is the patient getting worse? And you could always answer cytokines uh, because it's essentially these proteins that cause inflammation and swelling and you'd probably be right because they can't really refute it. But this, this picture essentially Document what this shows is that you got you know an injury here, and you get all these inflammatory cells that are kind of coming out of the bloodstream, and in the process of doing that, they're releasing these proteins, which cause edema, which cause capillary leak, and ultimately cause edema, can cause cause further injury. So, and that can happen again. It can happen anywhere from minutes to hours later. So, if you look at the at St. Al's in terms of our mechanisms of injury, anybody have any questions on any of that so far? We're all good. You're bored stiff. Tired. Keep going. Yes, sir. With the you mentioned one of the causes of this hypotension. How yeah. long does it take for somebody to be hypotensive and affect the cord? So that's a good question. So I'll give you a corollary, and, and it's the answer is nobody knows. But this, this is actually a great question. Can you repeat the question? So we'll oh, sure. So the question is, is how long do you need to be hypotensive before you're going to potentially see any damage? <laughs> And it's, the answer is, is there's no real firm answer. 
And, and the corollary of this, and, I'll, and the, what I'll tell you is, if you look at tourniquet use, it used to be, oh my God, you got the golden hour. So everybody says, oh, you got X number of times for tourniquet times, et cetera. But if you look at it, you actually have a lot more time than you think. Now, I think it kind of depends on some of those other extrinsic factors. So if you're hypotensive <coughs> and you've got a little edema, it's going to manifest itself. It's going to snowball a little bit more. So it, it could be anywhere. It could be minutes and it could be hours, and it kind of depends on the degree and the variation on it. So, does that answer your question? I think so. Okay, I'm vague. <laughs> Avoid it, avoid it at all costs. <laughs> so, if you look at our what our regional trauma sort of layout looks like, and the patients that, that are seen at the trauma center, the vast majority are all gonna be blunt trauma. So, you know, you got falls, motor vehicle accidents, uh, and then motorcycle crashes. Uh, the, we don't see a ton of, of penetrating trauma down in this area. So the vast majority of what we see here is going to be blunt trauma. So what we're going to do is we'll look, at, we'll look at a couple of different specifics. We're going to look at penetrating trauma, and then we're going to look at blunt trauma, and we're going to, and we're going to pick those apart a little bit. There's a fairly robust amount of, of data with respect to the penetrating trauma in this, and we're going to end up having to do a little bit of an extrapolation. But uh, this is a... What's called an MRI? This is an MRI image. Uh, this is just basically to show you that this patient had an injury to this to the to the vertebrae here. If you're ever lost on these, you kind of look at a structure you know. And so this is spinal fluid here. Spinal fluid is like water. This stuff's kind of the same color. It's white. So that's edema. If you look at this one, this stuff's white. This stuff's dark. That's hemorrhage. That's that's core, that's what cord edema looks like and that's what cord hemorrhage looks like on an MRI. So for those hunters in the room or following along here, uh, for penetrating trauma, you've, you've got essentially two different injuries. You've got your direct injury, which is where the projectile enters into the skin. Oftentimes it'll tumble, it'll fragment a little bit, and so you get this permanent cavity, which is the direct trauma associated with this. Secondary to that, you get the quote-unquote concussion wave which is oftentimes where you're going to see some of that secondary or collateral damage from the edema and everything else, and then as the projectile exits. So all, just because you see a little, in, a little bullet hole doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a whole lot more damage on the inside. So what's the data show us in terms of do we need to, to board and collar these patients? So this was kind of a, this was started in New York. This was an article in, in 2009. I tried to pick all the most recent stuff because that's about the best that we got. So the question was really, does, does spinal immobilization, is it necessary for these folks? And uh, so they looked at first 357 patients. This is at a strong Memorial Hospital in New York. Of those 54%, and this, was, this is a, what's called a retrospective study. So they, they basically went back and they, they pulled a bunch of charts and they looked at them. So this wasn't what's called a prospective study, which is what we'd really prefer to see in terms of literature. So you, you look at a bunch of charts and you try and pull any extrapolations out of that. So of those 357 patients, 54% of them underwent uh, pre-hospital spinal immobilization. Of those uh, 357 patients, 33% of them had an injury to the spine. Of those 33, half of them had neurodeficits with their fracture. So they had a spinal cord injury as well as a vertebral injury. The others, for the most part, had no spinal cord injury but had a fracture, and then about 9% of them died. All the patients with a spinal cord injury essentially ended up going down, going for surgery to get their vertebral section stabilized. But this is the kicker is that when they do the surgery, it's not done to reverse anything. It's basically there to stabilize people. So they were, they were essentially taking these people so that they could sit in a wheelchair without an unstable vertebral body in there. So they weren't doing it to try and reverse any of the neurologic things, which is really what we're concerned about for the vast majority. They were basically stabilizing the injury that the patient had. Uh, none of these people ever got better. They basically maintained what they got or they potentially got worse. So then they went back and they looked at the National Trauma Database which is it's a central repository, and this is where a lot of trauma data comes from. So they looked at 75,000 penetrating gunshot wounds. And, and just sort of an FYI, the vast majority of, of penetrating trauma wounds are chest wounds. 
So most of these that we see are going to be thoracic injuries. So of all these ones, 4% of them had a vertebral injury after the gunshot wound. Of those, a third of them had a, had a vertebral injury and a spinal cord injury. So our numbers are getting smaller. So starting with 75,000 patients, we're now dwindling it down to 3,000. And of those, one third of those, so maybe 1,000 out of 75,000 ended up having a fracture and a spinal cord injury. But more of them had a fracture without a spinal cord injury. And so overall, if you look at these, and this is going to come in a little bit later when we're talking about are we causing more harm than good. So we're looking at, at a small number of patients who all have the same injury. How many of these are, are unstable, if you will? The only thing that was uh, limited on this study was that when they look back at this, and again, it's because of the nature of how they looked at it was they didn't really, weren't able to tell who was immobilized and who wasn't immobilized. So the take home message is, is that basically the overall data supports that a spinal cord injury of the gunshot wound or penetrating trauma is due to the direct injury to the cord as opposed to the blunt force of vertebral column. And none of these patients benefited from spinal immobilization. Make sense? You with me? You got some people excited about the hunting thing. Uh, and, and again, you got to kind of say, well, these are all retrospective studies, so we got to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But you know, these numbers, if they're not, it's not like you're you're fussing 49 to 51 percent. You know, you're looking at some very vast differences with this. Uh, Waters and Seed looked at this as well in 2003, uh, and essentially what they found was that. Uh, spinal cord injuries after gunshot wound had a, a complete spinal cord injury 50 to 70 percent of the time and again had a lack of neurologic process uh, progress at one year post injury so uh, this is one of those again people just didn't seem to benefit a ton the injury was done uh, as I mentioned a little bit before most of these injuries are in the thoracic region followed by the thoracic thoracolumbar junction now I'm going to caveat this a little bit anything beyond T12 so anything, low, anything in the lumbar area, those, there was 25% of those patients who had a lumbar vertebral injury, 25% of those patients, so it's a small number, but a, and a small number of a small number, some of those patients actually had a little bit of neurologic progression at the one year mark. So they did see a hint of benefit. So in terms of practical speaking, if you have somebody that's shot in the belly and you see an you know, a exit wound, that it's somewhere around the spine, or you can imagine that the line transversing the two may have gone through there. Those are the people that might benefit from some stabilization. It's a little hard to put that one in a protocol given our small numbers. Uh, so now the question, and this was kind of interesting. So okay, what are we, are we doing harm to these patients? So this was again they were looking at the National Trauma Data Bank, and what they were looking at was mortality. Were we killing people by immobilizing them? So this was actually kind of a, this was a little bit more organized in terms of what they were doing. The independent variable that they looked at was, were they immobilized and did they die? And was there a correlation between the two? And so if you look at that, they look, again, large number of patients, 45,000 patients with penetrating trauma. The overall mortality was 8%. Those who ended up undergoing immobilization had an odds ratio for those who uh, never was a big statistics guy. But yeah, you're twice as likely to die if you were immobilized. Now, you got to ask yourself, well, why is that? Were these people just worse off to begin with? Um, you know, I think there's other variables that you can consider in this. But essentially, the that is a, a kind of a firm statistic. And again, you're not splitting hairs. It's not like it's 1.2. It's you are twice as likely to die. And uh, no group from the penetrating trauma had any survival benefit. Uh, of all of those 45,000 people, only 1% of them had a spine injury that was amenable to surgery. Of those patients, 74% had a complete spinal cord injury and would not have benefited after immobilization. So essentially, we didn't do a ton for them there. So based on this, and this is where the number needed to treat. So uh, how many patients would I have to treat to potentially benefit one? That's 1,032. So I have to see 1,032 gunshot wounds or penetrating trauma patients <clears throat> to make a difference in one of them. How many does it take to kill somebody? 
66. So I am much more likely, in, and again, this is looking at spinal cord immobilization. I am much more likely to kill somebody than to help somebody. Okay. So not much was accomplished. If anything, more, more harm was caused than good. And that was kind of the take-home message from that. So what about non-penetrating non -penetrating trauma or blunt trauma? So Nexus has been studied. It's been restudied. It's been validated. Nexus is one of those sort of benchmarks that I think has, has revolutionized pre-hospital care. It's a great study. It happened to come out of Pittsburgh. I have no potential bias. Um, and you can, always, you can look up all that. But if you remember those C-spine clearance rules, they're solid. The problem with, with a lot of the thoracic and lumbar spine is that nobody really knows a ton. So, or we've, ex and especially with respect to blunt trauma, so we're extrapolating a lot of this penetrating trauma data, but nobody's really done a lot of these prospective studies. I went back, I even looked at, I was working last night, I looked back and I tried to see if anything else had come up research-wise that was very specific to this, and the answer is no. So, what we essentially have to do is kind of make some reasonable extrapolations. Now, if you'll remember your anatomy of, of what the, you got your cervical spine up here, great, your thoracic spine, is very well protected. If you've got your, your thoracic vertebrae are attached to your ribs, your ribs come around, they attach to the sternum. I mean, this thing's kind of like a pretty solid structure. So it's pretty hard to cause a fairly significant injury in there. It's actually much more protected. However, the lumbar spine, you've got a lot more wiggle room. And so these are the ones that you might potentially see a little bit more injury to. Thoracic spine fractures occur in about 2% to 5% of blunt trauma, and again, they're considered more stable because they've essentially sort of self-splinted. Lumbar fractures, again, a little higher percentage uh, at about 4 to 6%. The C-spine is about, it's roughly 6 to 8%. So, of, of, of all of those sort of things, your thoracic are going to be the most stable. So if we're suspicious of an injury, are we able to identify it? And, th and that's where this Dormer ended up doing a study, which is kind of a, an interesting one. And essentially what they did is they did a nexus criteria on 13,000 patients. And what they, they did is they applied the nexus criteria to the thoracic and lumbar spine. They said, how accurate are pre-hospital providers at identifying a thoracic or a lumbar fracture? So they used this, essentially the same nexus criteria, and they had about a 92% identification rate. So they did pretty good. So uh, of all those fractures, none of these patients that they looked at, and this was blunt trauma, uh, of all these 13,000 patients, none of them had a significant spinal cord injury. So this was repeated again uh, by Burton, and he essentially said, we're gonna use the nexus criteria, and this was up in Maine, uh, to look at 13,000 patients. And what they ended up finding was they had a very, they had a smaller percentage of spine fractures. So we're gonna go back again, of all these 13,000 patients, small percentage of patients that actually have them. Uh, the percentages of fractures that they saw, this kind of mimics what we were seeing. For the, you know, for the most part, we see a lot of cervical injuries. These data are probably a little skewed based on their patient population, but uh, the thoracic, again, are the most stable. But they found that the, in terms of identification of a fracture, you had 100% sensitivity for the cervical, 99% sensitivity for thoracic, and 97% sensitivity for lumbar. So we, it's, it's validated. We can do this. We can identify these patients by, by basically feeling down their back, no distracting injuries, no neurologic deficits, no intoxication, no altered mental status. And those were the, the sort of the, those nexus criteria that they used. Uh, so now we can identify them. Now we got to try and figure out. So we've we've kind of felt down their back uh, in the in the while they're in whatever scene that they are. Now we have to try and get them from point A to point B, which is basically get them from their their accident scene into the into the face of the ambulance or get them on the cot. Obviously, we want we don't want to cause any injury, so we don't want to sling them over our shoulder or you know turn them into a pretzel in the process, but you know, these are real life situations. You got to get a patient that's potentially upside down, strapped in their car from here to laying down. And that is hard to do. 
That takes a lot of creativity. It takes a lot of common sense. So that's where this gets a little bit more challenging. So they never, the one thing that I kept looking for was they, they've done a couple studies that we're going to go through. And what they're looking at is how much cervical spine motion is there when you're extricating somebody or backboarding them or doing these things. What they don't ever do is say how much rotation, how much flexion are we doing in terms of extricating patients at, um, by putting them on a board in the thoracic lumbar area. So we'll look at cervical injuries because those are always the ones that we get our, a little bit more uptight about. So what Shaver did is they basically, he looked at the cervical spine movement during extrication. So he put these sensors on, on the head, on the face, on the trunk, and essentially what they were saying is how well are we keeping people in line? And this is if they've had a collar on. So they, uh, with or without a collar, I'm sorry. So essentially had these patients, and this was, it was a small sample size, but they essentially said, all right, here's our study variable. We're gonna have you just get out of the car. You know, we're gonna, we'll kind of help you, but we'll just have you get out of the car and lay down on the cot and see how you do in terms of movement. They did uh, assisted immobilization onto a long spine board, going head first, and then they did the C collar with the kit. You can make your own predictions and place your bets as you will right now. But what they found was that the least amount of movement of the cervical spine was if they just told people, get out of the car. Get out of the car and go and lay down. That, it caused the least amount of movement of the cervical spine. And these numbers are actually, it's kind of one of those, oh wow. You can see the long spine board was the one that performed the worst because the peak change in terms of degrees was 26.6. With the KED, 31, and the peak change for just getting out of the car was only 6.8. And this is, this is uh, important because if, what you, if you look at it, it takes about 11 degrees of flexion extension to potentially take an unstable injury and, and, make, and cause a spinal cord injury. So that's where these ones were kind of scary, because these are the things that we tend to use the most. But still use, and at this point, it's kind of still sort of need to be cognizant of it. Uh, so unfortunately, like I said before, there's not a whole lot of data in terms of, of uh, movement on the thoracic or lumbar spine in terms of these, of these injuries. This would have been a great study if they had put sensors all the way down the patient's back and said, all right, now let's look at all of these things. Unfortunately, they only did the cervical spine. But this is kind of where you need to think. I mean, it, it's, okay, if, if we're potentially causing more movement doing these other things, is there another way to potentially get them out of the car using some common sense to, to try and minimize the amount of movement as opposed to saying we always do things this particular way and getting a patient on a board. I thought this was great because they were getting this patient out of a car and, and they wrapped the cord around their neck. So, you know, I kind of, I always kind of come back to this standing backward idea, which it just is one of those ones that kind of makes me shiver after I, you know, look at these. Because this guy's probably been out walking around, and now he's doing the standing backboard thing. To me, it's a little bit sort of reticent of Hannibal Lecter. He's actually got a backboard back there, if you take a notice. <laughs> All right, so this is where I like the scoop stretcher. You know, so are the, what, the, what they were looking at is are scoop stretchers suitable for the use on, on spine patients. Now this is, again, they were looking at cervical spine movement. And what they said is, is okay, you got a patient laying on the ground. How much movement are we having from doing our standard log roll, which is essentially what we do day in and day out. They did a, the, basically a five-man lift. They used the scoop, and the, the scoop stretcher. And they all, in all cases, they had somebody hold the C-spine. Bet you can guess what I'm going to say. <laughs> so just uh, fo so for people that aren't involved, this is I give them this demonstration. But your standard, uh, your five man lift, essentially getting underneath the the higher the you know the shoulders, the hips, legs, and then somebody holding the head, uh, and then the scoop stretcher. Uh, what they did is they took these lightly embalmed cadavers, age of 83. <laughs> And they, they made a they took average weight, and what they did is they surgically made a C5, C6 injury. So they gave this guy a two-column injury, and then they put sensors on him. 
And they were, what they were looking at is they, they were looking at flexion, extension, and rotation, and lateral flexion on this. And they were, this is kind of what I mentioned before, but if you have greater than 11 degrees of displacement, I'm sorry, greater than 11 degrees of uh, displacement or 3.5 millimeters, you've taken an unstable injury and potentially given them a, a spinal cord injury. That's what your C5, C6 injury is going to look like. And, uh, oh no. Uh, so if you look at the log roll, it basically generated 3.9 millimeters of translation or more. So that's no good. Uh, the flexion and extension didn't real, really reveal a ton of significance. But if you think about it logically, you're trying to take, you're trying to hold stabilization, and instead of just going in a, in a one plane, you're trying to essentially manipulate almost in a, in a two to three dimensional plane to keep the, the cervical spine in line with the rest of the body, which is, you'd think it'd be kind of easy, but it's hard to do. Uh, the scoop stretchers essentially had no movement. <laughs> so for a simple, you know, for a simple extrication of I got to get them out of the house, I got to just basically get them over to a cot, and you can use them. That's a great option. Makes a lot of sense to use them. And then once you get them on the cot, you can unbuckle it. You can take it off. You can keep the patient supine and just sort of observe the same precautions that you would as if they were on a board. You just say, I'm not going to sit you up. I'm not going to stand you up. I'm going to just keep you flat. So back to the concept of selective spinal mobilization. Uh, as of right now, there's no clear definition. It's amazing. There's If you kind of just Google search this, you'll find all sorts of people all over the United States are now asking the same question that we're essentially talking about right now. And I'm not sure, Carrie, if they've come out with the, uh, any EMSP has actually come out with a firm position statement on it or not. No, I heard it's supposed to come out in the spring, but I haven't seen anything. Yeah, it's been a grumbling for about the last year and a half that they, this has been kind of in the works and they've been looking at all these things, but nobody's really come up with a, a definition of it. But usually it's always thought of as this all or none thing. It's if you get a cervical collar, you get yourself, you're on a board. I mean, it's kind of like you can't really separate the two. And that's essentially what we're doing. And, and I'm gonna say this once, and I'll probably say it again, is you're never gonna go wrong putting a, putting a C collar on a trauma patient. You will never be faulted for that, I promise you. You will be faulted if you don't, you know, obviously if they clear with Nexus and everything else, but it's not uncommon that, that we see patients that get brought in, they don't have a collar, and they're, they're intoxicated. And the, the care provider says, well, they're not that intoxicated. And it's like, you know what? Just, it's not, a, it's a very easy intervention to do on somebody. It doesn't have a lot of downsides. It's just, just if you have any suspicion, do it to protect yourself. So, uh, what we really need to do is clearly define and I think differentiate these. So this is essentially where you're, uh, what you paid for and come in here today. The proposed amendment is essentially what we looked at with Domer's study, which is essentially using a nexus criteria to clear the thoracic and lumbar spine. So if they have no midline back tenderness, no intoxication, normal level of alertness, no neurologic deficits, no distracting injuries, you can kind of clear them and, and use the best extrication method you think is, is appropriate to get them from point A to point B. Hey Ben. Yeah. Can I just point out too, remember that intoxication is not just alcohol. A lot of times we get tunnel vision into that, but we all know our patients who are grossed out on their benzos or their methadone, they are technically intoxicated and therefore don't meet this criteria. Absolutely, and even you, you kind of have to consider demented patients in that as well, I think. So altered level of, you know, just generalized altered level of consciousness, from, I guess maybe a better way to put it. So if they're all met, essentially it's use the best way that you think possible, be it a KED, if you think a KED's appropriate, if you think a long spine board's appropriate, if you think a, a scoop stretcher to get them from over to the gurney is what we're doing. Now. If they fail, so they don't meet criteria, and again, we're pretty good at identifying the spinal cord or the you know, vertebral injury patients, then you need to figure out kind of which of these things would be most beneficial to get the patient from point A to point B. So those are the patients, it's like putting a seat collar on a patient. You, you want to try and immobilize them as best you can. 
And then once you, you know, especially for scoop stretchers, try and get them off the board as soon as you can. You know, trying to roll somebody once they're on a, a narrow gurney off of a long spine board is going to be pretty difficult to do. And so, and, and we're not trying to eliminate them. We're trying to decrease the incessant use of them. So you're not going to get lambasted if you bring a patient in on a board. It's we're just trying to, to decrease the use of them for patient comfort, which is what we'll talk about in a little bit. And that this is kind of the, the hodgepodge section of this. So we're going to look at, at a couple of different variables of, of the uh, things that are not necessarily hardcore research related. Uh, so this is kind of, again, it's I smash my little finger and you end up fully immobilized on a board. So how about you guys? What, what happens with you? Back injuries. So this is the number one reason that people have to go out on temporary disability, end up with pain issues and all kinds of things. And oftentimes that can be from lifting patients and everything else. So we might be potentially able to impact some of this. Almost 50% of, of pre-hospital providers will suffer a back injury at one point during their career. 62% of those are caused by lifting, and the average cost to treat one of those is about $20,000 average. Runs high, runs low. So then you say, all right, well, we got them on a board, everything else. Now we've theoretically, you know, got them immobilized, well, how good are we at actually securing and immobilizing somebody? This was kind of interesting because they, they basically brought, they, these guys <coughs> sat in their, in their ER, and I, I think this was in, it was back east, and they basically, as any trauma patient came in, they looked and said, how, how well are these patients secured on their board? They looked at 50 patients in an observational study, 30% of them, so almost a third of them, had at least one unattached strap or piece of tape. 88% of them had at least greater than two centimeters slack in, a, in one of the lines, so these patients aren't secured to a board. So the conclusion, they're not adequately sort of strapped. When I started out and, and did this, the big thing was you'd always you'd put somebody on a board, one of your classmates, and then you'd say, oh, let's see how we did. You'd pick it up and you'd put it on its side and you'd go, <coughs> you know, and in the meantime, you've got the head immobilized with a, bed, with a head bed and everything else. Now you've got this thing fixed to the board and the body goes like this. Well, that's a problem. So, uh, so we need to be very careful. It's not, don't give yourself a false sense of security that once these patients are on the board that you've actually, you know, fully stabilized them. What else can go wrong? Pain. Patients get pain from laying on these things. This was great. They looked at the pain and, and uh, pressures while patients were on, on a board. On average, in the United States, a patient will spend 80 minutes on a board from the time they get put on till the time they're cleared or taken off at, at the receiving hospital. 80 minutes, that's a long time, over an hour, almost hour and a half to be on a board. They looked at the, the back raft or the air mattress versus non-mattress, and we're looking at pressures on these patients. In order to adequately power their study, they looked at 20 patients. And what they did is they looked at pressures at the, the head, the sacrum, which is where you're probably going to develop, these are the places where you're going to develop your decubitus ulcers. But they looked at the pressures at these areas and then looked at, at, a, at a pain during that time interval that they were looking at this. So with the mattress study, ironically, your pain was a little bit higher, but uh, the pain at the end went from 9.7 in the mattress study to 37.5. So these things hurt. If you've ever been on one, they hurt. I've been on one, they hurt. And I remember I was probably on the board for about 90 minutes. Um, and all of those numbers were statistically significant. So you are actually causing more pain. Pressures didn't change a ton over time, but if you look at the pressures at each of these areas, you've got eh, 30, 40, 145 at the sacrum. That's gonna lead to a pressure ulcer. We're gonna talk about that. So pressure ulcers, when the capillary pressure exceeds 32 millimeters is when you're potentially gonna develop. So exceeding 32. So even here, all of here and here. All these patients are gonna be at risk for pressure ulcers. 
as opposed to a lot of pressure over a short period of time, it's worse to have just that sort of low indolent pressure over a long period of time. There's other things that can potentially lead to this. Uh, basically, the uh, patients, their general health, uh, elderly, how bony they are, how obese they are. There's a, there's a lot of things that will factor into potentially who's going to develop these. So. Uh, anybody who's got diabetes and all these other things, they're going to be more prone to them. Uh, in terms of the extrinsic fractures, that's bouncing down the road on, a, on the backboard in terms of the shear, the friction, and moisture that develops underneath there. All those things are going to potentially make you more prone to develop a pressure ulcer out of all this. How much does it cost to treat a pressure ulcer? Anywhere between $5,000 and $40,000. So uh, essentially, uh, so Eldridge looked at trying to increase patient comfort. They were looking, in, uh, again, at the back raft. What they found was that, the, and what they were talking about was that these pressure ulcers, they don't develop immediately. They can take up to seven days to ultimately develop. The US will, will spend $11 billion a year to treat pressure ulcers. Now, why is this important? It's because, I'm sorry, and 60% of these are, are during acute care admissions. Now, why is this important? Is because these preventable complications are not being reimbursed oftentimes by insurance companies. So if you come in and, and you develop them because of this, they may not reimburse this and they're gonna be getting more and more strict on these things. It's kinda of like I developed a urinary tract infection while I was in the hospital being treated for something else. They may not reimburse for that. That's gonna put hospitals out of business. It's gonna jack up all of our insurance rates. What else? Airway management. Well, this is kind of a whole other topic unto itself, but fa uh, failed airway management was reportedly the second leading cause of trauma deaths. If you look at uh, spinal immobilization, this is kind of one of the, you know, Henry Wang is he's a guy I used to work with him in Pittsburgh. He's the big airway guru for those of you who follow along in any of this. But they've looked at this a couple of different times and essentially uh, the Spinal, trying to keep somebody immobilized in a, in a, on a board or with a collar, it's going to increase your difficulty with respect to trying to, to intubate these patients. So you look at the, the situations that you're in, your bad lighting because you're outside, somebody's trying to hold a little, you know, give me some shade, uh, the patient's immobilized on a board, you're laying down, that's, that's a tough way to intubate a patient. You know, luckily, Dr. Peterson and I, we get the bed up about here. You can put it down a little bit. You know, I got all kinds of backup devices. I got time. I got a respiratory therapist. It's amazing. We don't miss any. Or at least Dr. Peterson doesn't. Uh, overall success rate for pre-hospital providers, 88% for intubations. If you, they, they surveyed pre-hospital providers and said, how much more difficult is it if they're in spinal precautions to, to intubate somebody, it's about you know just shy of fifty percent, just shy, of, you know, twice as difficult to ultimately intubate somebody. The uh, success rates, and this was on on mannequins, basically, it it almost got it got twice as bad if you were trying to keep somebody immobilized. And the Miller blade made it a little bit easier, but overall. The minute you come across a trauma patient that's going to need to be intubated, it's going to be, a, it's a bad airway. Anything you see is a bad airway. Anything you guys see out in the field is a bad airway or a difficult airway. And so it's just making your job that much harder to do. So the question I always ask is, so you got this patient, you got them in a collar and they need to be intubated. What are my chances of paralyzing or pithing them when I actually intubate them? This is my own personal query into all this. Uh, so they looked at, at 38 patients with quote unquote, unstable fractures. So remember that's two or three column injuries and 23 with stable, none of them had any neurologic deficits and essentially there was no deterioration or adverse outcomes. So you're usually pretty safe if you're being judicious with this because you figure in all those, there was probably a little manipulation on people happening along the way. Okay, got them intubated. How about ventilating them? So this was strapping them down to a board, looking at pulmonary function tests in healthy, non-smoking males. They had 15 male volunteers, God bless them. Uh, probably got paid, that's okay. So what they did is they test their force vital capacity. That's how much air can they breathe out? 
how much can they breathe out in one second? And then there's this ratio that you can look at. So how much, basically, your question you're asking is how much are we restricting their, their breathing patterns or their respirations with this? They adjusted strap tensions to 10 millimeters of mercury, which is considered appropriate. And ultimately, they said there was a 50% reduction in all parameters. So you're inhibiting these patients' ability to breathe by putting them on a backboard and strapping them down. Luckily, 80 plus percent of patients are not adequately strapped down, so we're okay. <laughs> but, but if you look at this, you say, okay, this was 15 healthy non-smokers. Couple that to the patients that we see. <laughs> these patients have COPD, they have undiagnosed sleep apnea, they're smokers, they're all combinations of all of those. These patients are gonna, you're potentially, you gotta watch these patients' airways a little bit more. So what else can go wrong? So strap tension increases intrathoracic pressure, can increase intracranial pressure in the patient, uh, increased risk of aspiration, you can put straps down if it rides up on the belly. Uh, it can uh, cause delays because you know instead of putting them on a scoop and taking them, now you're going through and, and doing all these immobilization things and you potentially have you know, a critically ill trauma patient go back and think about that, those penetrating trauma patients that died, you know, higher percentage of patients were dying from this. You know, these patients, need, they need to get to it. They need to get to an OR is really what they need to do. Increased radiograph, so all those pain things that we talked about, you know, increased pain, oh, my back is killing me. Well, is it because of the accident or is it because you were on the board for eight minutes? So now you're obligating them to potentially more radiographs, more costs. So what do we do? Do you build a better mousetrap? Do you try and find some new device, gadget, gizmo, or do we just actually think about what we're doing and try and come up with a better way to try and help these patients? That's all I got. 55 minutes. Yes. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. So what I got from your studies in the beginning yeah. was that we are obviously doing more harm by putting somebody on a backboard. Most, most of the time. Most of the time. I also got from your personal caveats that you prefer the uh, scoop stretcher. Personally. And collar. Right. So I guess I'm inferring that you would prefer that EMS as a whole put people on a scoop stretcher and collar. If you can. If you can. Yeah. <clears throat> Is that taking the call or the uh, scoop stretcher away once you put them on the hospital bed. So ideally it's, it's once, and it's, so what we're trying to do, and this is where we've been working on the hospital level is we, because we obviously have to take them from your gurney on our trauma bed. So what next. we're trying to do is keep slider boards in there. And so it's just this and, and take them from your cot on a slider board over, or, you know, usually you have enough patients or enough people in the trauma, you can almost kind of, pull a sheet taut and almost do just a five man lift and get them over. Because So I'll give you the, the, the back end of this now. This is a good question. So the back end of this is, okay, so you get, them, you get them to me or Carrie, and we now, they go to CT. So anybody ever been to the CT scanner? So when you go to the CT scanner, you're on a hospital bed, you get wheeled over, they wheel the hospital bed right over the CT table. What's the CT table look like? It's this little shallow dip that goes like this. It's not, a, it's not a straight across training. So these patients kind of go <laughs> when they get down there. So they're, and, and we use slider boards when we do that. We do slider board transitions. But so the idea is to sort of mimic that same deal is take them from your stretcher, same level, slider board them over. And we're, and we're working with radiology and all these other folks because they have a little bit of a, of, of a they need to make sure that their radiographs are going to be able to be adequate that they can, they can shoot through a, a, uh, through a slider board, uh, as well as it's not gonna damage their plates and all these other things. My preference would be you do that. We used to have a, a plate that you can put underneath the trauma bed, and so you, could just, you don't even have to move the patient to get, them, to get a chest x-ray. You just put a little film underneath there and shoot right down through the trauma bed, and you're done. You don't have to like lift them up a little bit and get the, the plate underneath them and everything else. So, is that? Yeah, I, so is our changes coming on the hospital? Because we can do all we want, but we get rained out four times in a row by a doctor who doesn't understand, or the nursing staff who doesn't understand what and why we're doing things. We're going to quit doing them eventually if we keep getting. Yeah, and and what 
I've told, and so <coughs> I, you know, I've communicated at least to the members in our group within email. I said, look, don't ream them out. <laughs> if you have a problem, and this is where with my providers, if you have a problem with my providers, you come to me, and I will review it and I will see what happens. Okay. But my, you know, my stance is you guys should not be hearing anything unless you grossly fuck something up. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. I apologize. She's on your four, it's all right. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was trying to be really cognizant. I'm like, I know she's in the band. I know she's in the band. Um, so, but, uh, but my stance is, is you guys should not be getting any flack unless you are doing something completely egregious to a patient. Um, and, and usually that's, this guy's drunk, why didn't you put a cervical collar on? But you should, not, if you're doing, you know, what we're trying to assist you to do appropriately, you should not be getting any flack from that. So I always say, if you have a problem, come to me. And I'm sure Carrie would be the same way. She'd be like, you come talk to me, and I am happy because you guys have a hard enough job as it is. You do not need to be catching flack after being in, you know, a probably really bad situation out in somebody's house with police running around and everything else sweat and doing all these things to try and get somebody to the hospital, the last thing you need is at the end of your job to say, why did you do that right. for whatever reason? So theoretically, and, and we, you know, it's one of those, everybody's different. We get these from the trauma surgeons. Whoa, why did you do this? God, oh, geez. You know, you didn't do this right. And it's like, you know what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> Gotcha. It also yeah. knows if you're getting it from the staff at the hospitals, please let me know so that I can readdress that with them. There might be just a lack of education on their part because essentially it's just their nursing directors because I can't do all the education for the staff at all the hospitals in Camden County. So emails are sent to each of the nursing directors and then I'm relying on them to trickle down that information. So if you're getting it from the staff, then let me know so that I can go back out discuss it with specific staff members and make sure that it's just not a lack of education. There are going to be some growing pains with this as yes. with anything else. Change is never easy and change is never easy in medicine even more. And so there's going to be difference of opinions. There's going to be times where um, kind of you guys get stuck in the middle and that's what we're trying to avoid but you have to let us know if that happens. Ultimately we're trying to do the right thing for the patient. And, and we've, we've been pretty open, you know, with <coughs> Boise and Meridian and medical directorate and talking with those guys at least as well as there's, there's going to be conflict amongst you and that's going to happen as well. So, you know, if it's Canyon County that's with you on scene and they, you know, the, you know, you're first responding and they're transporting and there's a difference of opinion, it's going to happen. We all need to be, we need to be patient, we need to work together, and, it, and that is the ultimate, because we're trying to do the right thing for the patient. We don't want to keep doing what we're doing just because I don't want to get yelled at. So we're trying to do the right thing based on what evidence and, and information that we know. Yeah? Do you notice the difference, right? and this may seem insignificant to an extent, but the new scoop stretchers we use are designed to actually be qualified at stabilization backboards as well. And they don't scoop as well as the old ones we used to have. They don't have the like the little they don't wedge. Have the, the little yeah. So when you're sliding them under, you're, you're manipulating the patient quite a bit using the new scoop stretchers. Even I would think that if we went back to the older ones, I love those old ones. That's what I used to I use. Do too. I do I think they work much better. And for something like, I think the scoop stretcher idea is a great idea. I just don't think the current ones that we have. I think you're going to manipulate them just as much, if not more, as if you're putting them on a regular backboard. If we that's that. That. And that's something you know going through SOCC. Which you guys are all part of, aren't you? You guys are represented on SOC, don't you? Standards of care. Yeah, we usually, I think we've got representatives from every agency on that. And that's, they're looking at kind of product type stuff and, and it's good, Those, it's, it's a good it's a good thought. You know, yeah, I mean, the, the previous idea is we can scoop them and then mobilize them to that board and take them in that way and not have to change again. But going to this idea, it's kind of defeating the purpose because it doesn't go on right. smoothly. Yeah. But then, and, you know, a lot of those, it's like the little lady with a hip fracture. I mean, gosh, you're going to roll her onto her side with a hip fracture and all these other things to get her immobilized because she, you know, fell down some stairs. And she's got, it's, that's, that's almost torture. So, anybody else? So, again, to clarify, you would prefer to remove the scoop stretcher once they're on the gurney? Yeah. Okay. And, and again, if you don't, don't panic. But, you know, the idea is 
to get them, you, and, and then and I'll, I'll reinforce this as well, as once you get them on the gurney, and if you do remove the scoop stretcher, you still observe the precautions of keeping them flat. You don't sit them up, you don't do anything else, you still keep them flat, you, you know, and again, seat collar, worst case scenario is you put a seat collar on them. Actually, worst case scenario is you don't and they have a fracture, but, um, but yes, it would be get them, on, get them onto the gurney, and get them on a padded mattress so they're not going to get the pressure ulcers, they're not going to have the pain, all these other things. Still so position of comfort, I mean, for the majority of them. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else? All right, well, hopefully I didn't bore you to death. I appreciate your time. Hopefully it was Thank you. Thank you. Sure.